Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And any given discussion of quantum computing usually starts with a discussion about qubits, aka quantum bits. And these are usually contrasted with classical bits, which in the general world, if you're not having to talk about different kinds of bits, you would just say bits. And we like to think about classical bits as coming from a set 0, 1. But I would like to say a few things about this before we get into qubits. So I'll talk about classical bits for a bit and then talk about qubits in a later lecture. So as far as the purposes of today's discussion goes, this could also be thought about as a general discussion about computing, not specifically necessarily quantum computing. The main point I want to make is that, in general, you should not think about the zeros and ones here as numbers. They might be numbers. We often interpret them as numbers, like the integer 0 and the integer 1. But the best way to think about this 0 and 1 is that these are really just sort of generic symbols that represent two different states. And over time, through a series of technologies of mechanical relays and vacuum tubes and bipolar junction transistors and metal oxide semiconductor transistors, we've gotten very good at storing and manipulating these classical bits. And quite often we will think about the symbol zero mapping to the concept of the number zero in a binary numbering system. And sometimes we might think of our symbol one as mapping to the binary number one in a binary number system. But again, these are just generic markers representing one of two possible states. You might as well call them frowny face and smiley face. We'll often use these symbols to represent a concept of false and true, if we can think about propositional logic. So this is a Boolean logic. Now in a programming language like C, we'll often equate the number zero with the concept of false in something like an if-then statement. And similarly, we'll equate the number one with the concept of true, but that's somewhat arbitrary. And it pretty much arises from the fact that many microprocessors will have a branch instruction that branches are not based on rather the value of a certain register is zero. Now in your standard introductory computer engineering class, you'll often draw circuits like this. You'll have a AND gate that takes a couple of inputs and maybe we'll take the output of that and put it into an OR gate and say we'll label these variables as A, B, and C. And let me denote the outputs here as E and F. So in a class focused on logic, we might write something like F is equal to A and B, where the AND here represents a logical AND operation. And then we could say OR with whatever C is. Now, let me put some parentheses around here to make the precedence clear. In every programming language I'm aware of, AND will take precedence. But this is using this Boolean logic kind of idea. We could also write something like F is equal to, say, A times B plus C, where the plus here might be interpreted as modulo 2 arithmetic. So 1 plus 1 is equal to 0, and you can imagine there is a carry that we're going to throw out. And in this case, we have this conceptual mapping between 0 and false, 1 and true, the AND operation with multiplication, and the OR operation with addition. So we can map these things back and forth, but really what's happening inside the computer is that there's just two states that we call 0 and 1 out of convenience but we interpret as numbers zero and one or as concepts of false and true as is convenient. Multiplication takes precedence over addition, but let me add some parentheses here just to be consistent. All right, so let's talk about multiple bits. What if I had zero, one, zero, 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 one, one, one? All right, 
So what is this? Well, you might look at this and say, okay, let me interpret this as a binary string. So this would be two to the zero. This is associated with two to the one. This would be associated with two to the two. See, so three, four, five. This would be two to the six. And that's not a very good looking power, is it? Let me make it more like that. There we go, I like that better. So what is this? This would be one plus two plus four plus 64 is two to the six. So that would give me 71. But is this true? I made a big assumption in interpreting this string of bits. I interpreted these symbols, zero and one, as binary digits in an integer base two number system. But maybe there would be another way that I could interpret this bit string. What if this was an integer represented according to a binary coded decimal scheme? Okay, in this case, I would wind up with these four bits here representing the number seven as a four bit integer. But in a binary coded decimal scheme, this represents a tens place to the left of that seven. So this would correspond really to 47 if I interpret this as a binary coded decimal scheme. Some older microprocessors like the 6502 actually had a flag that you could set that would switch its arithmetic from regular integer binary to binary coded decimal. Things like games would use this kind of scheme to keep track of scores. Later processors tended to not have something like this built in. But here's the thing, maybe this isn't a number at all. Maybe this represents something like a character in the ASCII character set. So this number, which interpreted as a usual integer, would be 71, and the ASCII character set represents the letter G. And I'm putting this little dash there kind of on the end of the G to try to make sure you don't think of it as a number six. Now, this interpretation of that bit string, that's just as valid as this interpretation or this interpretation. Again, here we're not thinking about these things as numbers. We're thinking about them as symbols. These symbols zero and these symbols one and a certain string of them represents the letter G. People often think about computers as things that crunch numbers. But I think it's best to kind of go back to basics. And if you look at Alan Turing's original work in theoretical computer science about Turing machines, he characterizes computers as machines manipulating symbols. And we may interpret some of these symbols as numbers, and we may define different manipulations of those symbols to represent different numeric operations like multiplication or division or taking a square root. But those symbols can represent other kinds of information like strings and can represent other kinds of operations such as translation from one language to another. And the reason I'm emphasizing this so much before we ever talk about qubits, aka quantum bits, is that when you're programming a quantum computer, you usually wind up having to think at a much lower level than you usually think at when you're programming your standard desktop, laptop, classical computer. When you write something in a programming language like C, you're used to saying something like, oh, I'll have a 32-bit IEEE floating point variable. Let me call that A. And maybe I'll have an integer variable. Maybe that's 32-bit. Maybe it's 64-bit. We'll have to look at what your particular C compiler does. And then someplace else later on in the code, you will multiply this float A times this integer B, and this B will automatically cast up to a float to do the multiplication. And that all kind of happens magically. When you're talking about quantum computers, you really have to think about how your data is represented. And there's a lot of different ways to represent it. And interestingly, most of the first ways you think of to represent your data are probably not the right ways. If you wind up thinking about representing your data as just a bunch of zero and ones, you're probably not going to be getting all of the speed out of the quantum computer that you can. And important note about quantum computers is they don't magically speed up generic algorithms.
there's only certain kinds of problems for which quantum computers can give you a speed up. 